of MOOCs. So thank you very much, KMOOC. And to start, we are going to invite our keynote speaker to give a presentation regarding to institutional level. We have a pleasure to have Professor Dr. Jin Huk Lim. Uh, Professor Jin Huk Lim is an excellent person. He has so much knowledge to share. Each time I listen to him, I fall in love. <laughs> so today, let me briefly explain to him about, uh, sorry, to you about his uh, profile. Uh, professor Lim is a professor of management information system. Right now, he is at the Graduate School of Information Technology at uh, Postech, Republic of Korea. He has a lot of management positions before, and right now he travels around the world to give his knowledge, to share his knowledge in MOOCs. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Professor Lim. Good morning. Well, I'm very glad to be here again. The reason why I'm saying again means last January I came to this place to organize this meeting. Finally, I see the result with many uh, <laughs> participants today. So, well, again, I'm very glad. Well, I'll talk about MOOC from institutional perspective. Well, I wonder if, can you recognize this person? Very famous uh, professor. His name is Clayton Christensen at Harvard, Harvard Business School. Well, he got his reputation with his theory on disruptive innovation. Now everybody talks about disruptive innovation in addition to sustaining innovation. Well. He mentioned also his, uh, he applied his theory to education. And he said that uh, in an interview in February 2013, said that almost half of the schools will disappear in 15 years. Have you ever seen any uh, university disappear because of the MOOC? Have you ever heard that any school closed? No, I haven't heard about it. But wait, he said that in 15 years, so to see <laughs> whether uh, his uh, saying may uh, will vary or not, we have to wait until <laughs> 20, 20, 25, uh, 28. But Yes, I see some. Uh, yes, uh, I see uh, some critics say that uh, MOOC is not a threat. MOOC is not a <laughs> MOOC is not a threat to the traditional institution. But uh, today I'll talk about again uh, from institutional perspective how how it will affect uh, our institutions. Well, he said that finally, I'm not worrying, but he said that I'm excited. So, we sh should we excited? <laughs> should, should or should we worry about? Depending on how you prepare. Uh, okay, why uh, does a school MOOC? Okay. <clears throat> well, according to a survey done by researchers at Columbia University, uh, they found that five major reasons for MOOC. Why schools developing uh, MOOCs? MOOCs uh, they found that five major reasons. First, they said that extend reach and access. Yes, of course. Yeah, through MOOC, you can reach learners all over the world. And second, building and main, uh, maintain 
brand. In other words, jump on the bandwagon. So, yes, uh, we provide MOOCs. The, your presence itself, uh, what? Put, uh, jump on the bandwagon. Well, improving economics, yes. By offering uh, MOOCs, you can uh, raise some uh, revenues, making uh, money out of doing this. And innovation, a new way of teaching. Research on uh, teaching and learning. They try to understand how it will uh, change the way of uh, teaching and learning. Well, these are five reasons. But remember that this survey has done based on the early MOOCs. So if we uh, do uh, this kind of survey once more, we may see some uh, changes uh, in regions like this. Well, now let me talk about uh, relationships between institutions and MOOC providers. Well, we know that MOOC providers like edX, Coursera, Udacity, they are not schools who are competing, who are not competing with us. But getting courses from a university, then offer that to the general public like this. So this is the first version of MOOC. MOOC means schools provide the courses through a MOOC provider to general public. Well, many people's understanding there, they think that, oh, that's the MOOC. But we know that it's evolving, not stay there. The second step, now they've been offering micro degree specialization and accessories like this, a package on a certain subject like this. And some schools are offering uh, credit courses, like edX teamed up with Arizona State University, and they've been offering college credit courses. And, well, everyone knows Georgia Tech offers uh, online master's degree in computer science with uh, Udacity and AT&T. But so far, still, it, that doesn't affect directly the college education because they've been getting courses and offering to the general public. So it doesn't affect the, the traditional schools. But now let's look at this. Some courses are coming back to universities. And they've been offering those courses as SPOC, small private online course. Well, there are some good courses out there. So they contact with them, like uh, yesterday, uh, the Dr. Pong said that he's offering uh, Java programming through the MOOC. And some nations, even he mentioned that Saudi Arabia contact with him and uh, can we use your course to teach our students? In that case, it comes back to and offered at small private online courses. <coughs> and also, we can think of MOOC-based flipped learning. So using MOOC as a pre-class uh, activities or requirement. And after that, come to class to talk about and discussion, problem solving can be done in face-to-face -face mode. And also we see a combination between these two. Let's, for example, uh, MIT offers master's degree in supply chain management. You know, the 10 month long program now cut in, into half. The first five months long is offered as a MOOC. So anybody can take that program, no need to come to MIT campus. But after finishing, then if they want, they are admitted to the regular, uh, the second half program. 
to, to, to come to campus like this. So, well, I, I want to see more evaluation, not stop there, further. And then uh, depending on your situation, you may come up, with, come up with different model. But my point is that don't just think MOOC as the first version only. Well, MOOC means this. Many people still keep on saying that MOOC means, okay, free course offered through a MOOC provider to the general public. That's not true. So you have to fully understand it's an evolving, it's evolving. So you may see more different models. Well, another term like this, residential MOOC uh, by MIT. MOOC mainly for outsiders, but now MOOC for their students. That's called residential MOOC. Like positioning of an institution. Well, according to the same survey I mentioned earlier uh, by the researchers at Columbia University, they found that a school may position as a MOOC provider, like some top schools. You, when you go to edX, you see uh, some, uh, a list of schools. They've been offering courses. So they are MOOC producers. And some schools, while offering MOOC courses, and also they've been taking advantage of some of the MOOCs for their own education. So they play both of them, provider and the consumer. And some school consumers, they do not provide, all, uh, provide MOOCs, but rather they are using for their own education. And there are many schools out there. They want to see, wait and see. Still, they've been uh, hesitant to jump on. But I think eventually they have to pick one of those three, whether a provider or provider and a consumer or as a consumer. So eventually uh, these schools will join one of these. MOOC-based education. Still, uh, many people, again, as I mentioned earlier, based on the version one, they think that MOOC is another version of uh, online or cyber learning. Oh, I understand, but you know, MOOC is uh, just kind of an advanced uh, uh, version of edu uh, cyber education or uh, e-learning. But that's not true. The reason why I mentioned this, MOOC-based education means the ultimate goal is the personalized learning personalized learning, individual learning, in other words. So to, to achieve this goal, first, it should allow adaptive learning. Adaptive learning means, depending on, you, depending on a learner's understanding, we allow them to go or repeat it once more. And just-in-time learning. Many people talk about, when they talk about MOOC, the low completion rate. But they, are, they not fully understand the nature of MOOC. MOOC means for just-in-time learning. Just I want to learn this part or in. I don't want to go through from chapter 1 through 16, something like this. They want to jump around, like when they go to a buffet. Okay, I want to pick what I like. I want to skip this part. It should allow this just-in-time kind of learning not force them to go through from the top to the end. OK, I'll give you a certificate, something like this. And self-paced learning. Well, earlier day, again, MOOC was very similar to our sim uh, traditional courses. But now, many of them switch to self-paced learning. In other words, they open up a course for a certain period of time, like a six month or one year. Then depending on your understanding and your time, you go through by yourself. You can finish in one week or one month or up to you. We see more and more this kind of 
uh, MOOC. And learning, another very important concept by Dr. Bloom. Everybody talks about Bloom's taxonomy, but Bloom's another contribution is mastery learning, to make sure that everybody reach certain level, competence-based learning. And flipped learning. Well, we know that MOOC sometimes not enough. Online learning is not enough. Still, we need face-to-face -face, uh, portion, depending on global learning. Less well. This morning we uh, witnessed that uh, the global uh, cooperation between MOOC, JMOOC, TIMOOC, and many many different. Global learning can be possible now. So we have to think about what's your target audience, main uh, target. Well, general MOOC learners. And second, paid MOOC learners, spoke learners, and flipped learners. Well, we have to think about different types of learners that we've been focusing on, not one size fits all. There's no such a thing like this. With one MOOC, we try to serve everybody. Depending on who one you serve, you have to uh, make it differently. So that's why modular approach is needed. So we have to assemble them, depending on, not uh, regenerate from the scratch. Quality assurance in industry. Do you recognize this device? Do you know what it is? Anyone? <laughs> That's Samsung Note 7, the ill-fated smartphone. <laughs> what happened? Everyone knows this. The battery. <laughs> Got fired. Samsung launched it in last August with a big flash. But one month later, they suspended sales and stopped production. And one month later, they decided to recall. So you see quick happening like this, and a lot of loss. Well, quality issue here. Well, in industry, they've been talking about Six Sigma. Uh, I think you understand what is Six Sigma. Three out of one million. Very small defective item, but still they do not allow this. Am I right? But when it comes to education, do we have such concept? Quality control, quality educate, quality assurance? Yeah, everyone talk about quality assurance, but what kind of quality do, do you talking about? That's what Bloom already talked about in 1984 in his paper, said two sigma problem, he pointing out. Well, average teaching will end up with 52, 50. 50-50. In other words, 50% defective items. Wow, I cannot believe it. 50% defective items, not uh, one out of a million, something like this. One out of two. That we have to raise it up to mastery learning, my level. Then we can reduce the defective item. 68% achievement. Eventually, he mentioned that 98%. That's two sigma. So we have to raise our quality up to two sigma. But still, we are here. Can you believe this? While we are here, still we've been talking about quality education and quality issues. There's no such thing. <laughs> we have to raise it up at least to the mastery learning. So MOOC has that possibility to raise 
our learning uh, effectiveness like this. Expected benefit of doing this? Yes, of course, for our student, we can provide quality education. And from faculty's perspective, we can finally talk about faculty's productivity. There's not such a concept in education, productivity. <laughs> okay, you talk about that in the industry, but not in education. Yes, finally, we can talk about productivity in education. And of course, if we have more effective and efficient learning and satisfy our customers, students, then of course what schools in a better position to compete with others. So everybody's uh, happy. Three stakeholders, students, school administrators, and faculty both can be happy. Three key success factors. Well, first, it should come with technology. Technology finally allow us to achieve this idea that uh, Dr. Bloom talked about so many years ago. <laughs> but technology didn't spot his idea. But finally, now we see that technology come to the level finally to what try to 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 make mastery learning. And human perspective, yes, faculty and staff, all we have to change our what, way of thinking in learning. And schools also change their priority in terms of uh, their commitment and resource and policies and so forth to, uh, to encourage this idea, to experiment this idea. So who initiate MOOC in your organization? I see three different approaches. At the very beginning, like a bottom-up approach, in other words, on voluntary basis. Is there anyone who want to try MOOC, something like this, all right? So you're based and who has strong ownership on that particular course. This is my course, so I'll offer as a MOOC, something like this. Another approach is like this. Your president or may say that, oh, we have to try MOOC. So would you try this? He's dictating somebody to offer a MOOC like this, top-down kind of approach. But we see pros and cons in both of uh, the approaches. So what I suggest is that now we need some strategic approach by finding, by developing a comprehensive plan or what kind of vision, what try to achieve by doing this. We need some kind of a uh, comprehensive plan to go with, not just an ad hoc kind of approach. We try this and see how it works. Muk jar. Do you need a jar, jar in your camp campus? <laughs> the reason why I'm putting it is that they say, who will set the vision and strategy? And who will secure TOPS commitment? And who will be in charge of uh, planning, staffing, developing, operation of MOOC? Somebody should be in charge of this. But in organization, typically they ask what? Center for Learning Director take place, uh, take a role in this area, or they set up a ad hoc committee, MOOC committee, something like this. But to me, they need a position to CIO in industry, CIO at the executive level, who can talk directly with the president of your organization on this issue. So Chief Innovation Officer, we need a position, something like this, okay, in campus. Well, we haven't heard about CIO in education. 
though again companies setting up a position like EIO. So eventually we need a position like this, who will be fully in charge of the MOOC initiative in your organization. <clears throat> Some also, we have to think about some legal and policy issues, uh, but I'll skip this part. And now I'll talk about a uh, post tech case. Well, by the end of last month, I retired from my university. <laughs> and after reti uh, retiring, you understand, I have to enjoy traveling and so forth. But I joined this new university called post tech. It was ranked number four in the world in the category of world best small universities. So I'm very pleased to join this university because the president, uh, he took his position last year and he was the ex-minister of education in Korea. He's a very influential person. He was eager to implement the MOOC and flip learning at his campus, but for the past year, even though he, he uh, tried to push them, but not much in progress. That's why he asked me to join and work together. So I'm now looking at our <laughs> Well, current at post is that well, they offer courses uh, through KMOOC, uh, two courses at the, uh, at the first year and five courses. And this year, they are very ambitious to offer uh, 13 courses. And f as far as the flipped learning, last year they started. Uh, courses. And again, the president was very ambitious to reach 90%. <laughs> so I couldn't believe it my, myself. 90%. But remember that according to the survey done last year uh, in the United States, over 80% of faculty members been implementing flipped learning. But still, it's very ambitious. And another area is the residential uh, MOOC. Schools encourage students to take overseas uh, MOOC courses up to four credit courses. They reimburse a uh, fee they paid to get a certificate. But when you see here, these are isolated. So what I suggest them to do this work is that first, let's have a powerful MOOC platform to begin with. And these four different types of models uh, should be connected. And well, KMOOC, and they try to offer courses through uh, Coursera, somehow linked with post uh MOOC. And also, it should be used somehow in flipped learning, and it should be linked with uh, the residential MOOC. So these areas, not as an isolated effort, we have to all put them together to take some synergic effect. Well, last topic. I'm going to talk about the cost management of MOOC. Well, according to the same survey I mentioned earlier uh, by the researchers at Columbia, it's very expensive to develop a MOOC course like this, depending on how you design. If you want to do it very professionally, it's very expensive. But most cost is involved in terms of what? Video recording. But when you think about uh, in terms of cost, well, at the beginning, you know, to jump on the bandwagon, we don't care about the cost. But when you expand 
and how can you afford this? In other words, you have to think about return on investment. So, how first we try to control, contain the cost, more efficient way to design. Well, think about uh, many different ways to make uh, videos, not just recording what I'm lecturing uh, here right now. So, how we can reduce the cost without sacrificing the quality is uh, one of the big issues that we've been talking about because we've been keep on adding courses. It means cost is a big issue. Well, I'll not talk about technical matters, but again, that's the uh, thing we have to talk about, think about. I think time's up, so I timely finish presentation. Well, thank you for uh, your listening. Thank you so much, Professor Yim. Uh, we still have time, though, sir, for a few questions from the floor. Anyone would like to ask questions, please feel free, and we will bring you the microphone. So I would like to start with one question, if I may, please, sir. Oh, okay. Because uh, Postec is very well doing in terms of research. Uh, what kind of relationship between MOOCs and research that you are looking after at the moment? Can you share with us, please? Thank uh, you. Yes. Well, you know that uh, when a survey institution like a TAT or US or, uh, well, many survey organizations are paying attention to research perspective of an organization. So how well uh, develop your reputation in terms of research. That's why post -tech or some other Hong Kong uh, uh, University of Science and Technology, they build up their reputation. But every now talking about the what, fourth industrial revolution. In other words, now education becomes very, very important. Well, we are research school, so we don't care about teaching. That's the typical attitude like a post -tech. But one point, one thing I want to tell you that at MIT, everyone knows that MIT is a research school. But they claim that we should be a hub of education research. That's what I like. Education itself is part of research areas. They look down upon education, but not anymore. You see, it has a big, big impact on the whole Society, am I right? Yeah. So education itself should be the top agenda in research, not just teaching. Oh, teaching is your, your job, so we don't care about <laughs> your teaching. We have we've been focusing on research. But remember, please remember that education research becomes the top priority. It should be top, one of the top priorities now because that determines our fate. As I mentioned that Dr. Christensen mentioned that half of them will disappear. How to survive? Surviving, that's the key. Am I right? So through education research, we have to come up with our own model based on what I uh, have studied. You see many different models. But still, you have to find your own way to implement this idea in your own campus to be successful, not just to survive, but to be successful in this new era. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So a big hand to him. Thank you very much, Professor Im. And we have one more session to go this morning. It is going to be um, a panel on the um, track number three, institutional level talk. So may I please invite our moderator, Dr. Hun Ju So, on stage, please. Dr. Hun Ju So is director of the office of KMU planning and the Office of the Public Relations and International Affairs at the National Institute of Lifelong Learning, or what we call NIA, of the Republic of Korea. In short, he is one of the big person who drive KMOOC until today. So please join me to welcome him on stage. Thank you.